On today's show, the Warriors get sunburnt, but how close are they when Curry comes back? And Miami bounces back against the Boston Celtics. Are they still the best team in the East? We're going to have some fun today on Thursday. Locked on NBA. Let's go. You are locked on NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome. You are locked on to the NBA. My name is Nick Engstead, host of the Locked On Mavericks podcast. Thanks for making Locked On NBA your first listen every day. Remember, we are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. Subscribe to the show. Watch us on YouTube. Watch the Locked On Now show on YouTube. Lots of good stuff going up all the time. And joining me, as always, straight from YouTube, host on Thursday, Pat, the designer from Locked On Bulls. Pat, what you got for me? Hey, man. Listen. Another night of great basketball. We got a ton of games to cover, and we got some questionable decisions coming down the stretch. I'm having <laughs> fun tonight. Questionable decisions from the players involved, but from us, our, our decision-making is on point right now. Oh, God. We, we, we know what we're doing. Let's start with the last game of the night. There's 11 games on the slate. We'll break them all down. We'll talk about all of them. We'll break down the Phoenix-Golden State game first, Miami-Boston, and then, of course, we'll play our favorite game every single week. Count it up. We'll count up the most fun, interesting things and biggest questions in the NBA surrounding these games. Let's start with the Golden State Warriors thought they had it, just like many teams before them thought they had the Phoenix Suns right where they wanted them. And then the Suns went 107 to 103. The Suns in this game, I think I think Richard Jefferson said this like 12 times at the, at the end of this game, that the Suns shot 41% from the field, 25% from three. They were on the road, and they still... Uh, won this game somehow. They were missing Cam Johnson, JaVale McGee. Obviously, Steph Curry is still out for the Warriors. Uh, Phoenix took control early. They got an 11-point lead very early in the game, but the Warriors fought back late in the game. Devin Booker made some crucial mistakes, fouling, things like that. And then just weird stuff for the Warriors. Draymond Green had a jump pass off of an inbound that (laughs) should have gone to Otto Porter if he would have slipped, and that turned into a turnover. And then Jordan Poole, Thought he was getting fouled. Chucked up a half-court shot with seven seconds to go. He didn't get it, and the Suns go on to win. Pat, tell me, if the Warriors are healthy, how close are they to beating the Suns? You know what? I think they're pretty close, and the reason I say that right is the emergence of Jordan Poole. We've seen Jordan Mm. Poole on a consistent basis be the reason that this uh, Golden State team has done such an excellent job in the stretch without Stephen Curry. Now, yeah, they've fallen back. You expect to fall back a little bit in the standings without Stephen Curry there, but you saw this game tonight. Like, If Jordan Poole got any help, any help at all, (laughs) <laughs> from Clay Thompson tonight, we might be having a completely different conversation. Of course, Clay Thompson goes out there tonight, shoots one for 10 from the three point line and five for 21 in the game overall. He scored 13 points. Now, Andrew Wiggins giving that normal contribution, but you needed that kind of other guy who's going to be that, hey, can you give me a little bit? You you got anything in the tank? Can I have somebody else get me 20 points? Jordan Poole had 28. No one else even cracks 38. 20 points. I'm sorry, 38, my yeah. bad. And no one even else cracks 20 points on the night. And, and I get like you're going to him. There were a lot of fluky things at the end. I'm not going to lie to you. Steve Kerr kind of agreeing with the decision. As you saw Jordan Poole come down to court to just fling that thing up there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you can see, you can see hey, good you can, shot. Yeah, you I can like see that. Steve Kerr mouth to him. Good shot. So good, it was so okay, weird, bro. So I, I get what he like. He's trying to like calm his player down, right? He's like, yeah, I get you were trying to go for the foul there at the end with the half court shot. He thought Devin Booker was going to come up and foul him, so he's like, yeah. just trying to calm down his player in the moment. But yeah, I, I'm with you. I think I think the Warriors are are a, a little closer to the Suns, but I'm going to give the Suns a little credit here. They they came in and won the game, even though yeah. they were shooting that bad. I'm not sure how much more the Suns are going to shoot that bad. This team is close to shooting like 50, 40, 90, or 50, 40 as a team <laughs> from the field and from three. So they also were missing Cam Johnson. That's a big, that's a big miss for them. Obviously yeah. not as, not as big as Steph Curry, but that's still a big miss for them. And uh, yeah, I, I think they're still clearly ahead of the Warriors for sure. The Warriors still have a lot of stuff to figure out, but Curry changes the whole offense too. Like uh, you mentioned, you mentioned earlier, uh, Jordan Poole. When Curry's on the court this year, for, like over four thousand possessions, mm-hmm. the Warriors have one hundred and fifteen offensive rating. They score one hundred and fifteen points per one hundred possessions. 
with Curry off the court and Jordan Poole on the court, that's like 2,000 possessions. They score 110 points per 100 possessions. Really good. Those are both incredible numbers for an offense. Curry and Poole both off the floor. The Warriors score 98 points per 100 possessions. That would be like one of the worst offenses in the NBA. Uh, So they need both of those guys or at least one of those guys to be on the court at all times. And when Curry's missing and just Poole is out there, they just don't have enough offensively to be able to, to hang with some of these teams, even if it's the Phoenix Suns not shooting their best. The interesting thing to look at, too, and, I, and I'll ask you this, you know what I'm saying? You saw the Suns, and it's a caveat, but but I think a major one, uh, 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 get seven less turnovers in this game. Oh. I think the Suns, or I think the Golden State Warriors kind of shot themselves in the foot. The turnover battle was 21 to 14. You turn this ball <laughs> over to this Sun team, what, what's your term? Sunburned? Sunburned. Yeah, 29 points off of turnovers. That's how you get sunburned right there. You're sitting there with the face down, you roll over, you got the straps yeah. on the front. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's how you, you got get... the, like, you held the book and you have the, the outline yeah. of a book because it li- was laying on your chest. You fell that's asleep. That's how you get that on you, right? Right there, so I mean, the sunburn comes from what the Warriors did to themselves, and that's why I think they're a little bit closer in this matchup than we may see from what we saw tonight. Oh, the the Warriors shot themselves in the foot with turnovers. Cut to every single Warriors fan going, "Yes, of course we did." This is what the, <laughs> it's like what this team does. It seems like at this yeah. point, if they can cut down the turnovers, if they can, you know, get Curry back, hit more shots, have some more offense that's not just Jordan Poole being awesome, yeah, and then they got a chance. But th- all those things still have to go right for them, for sure. Um, yeah. Incredible game, though. <laughs> the Draymond Green, Jay Crowder stuff going back and forth. Do you side on one of those sides? Because it seems like people really hate Bro. Crowder at times, but then some people really hate Draymond, too. So you're like, which side am I agreeing with on this? Here's my thing. First off, the Bulls, <laughs> Tom Thibodeau had his way. Yeah, yeah I'm going to do that again. Yeah, If Tom oh, Thibodeau had his way, Two Draymond Green would be a bull. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. If Tom Thibodeau had his way, Draymond Green would be a bull. That's all that matters. Talk but, with a Bulls fan at any point about the NBA. They'll bring up Thibodeau. Uh, they'll find a way. Hey, hey, listen. It's all we got to hang our hats on right now. It's been a while since June. <laughs> um, no, but, but honestly, like, Looking at both of these guys, right, it's hilarious because it becomes the flopathon. Like, yeah, Draymond comes down at one end, coming down to the end. Uh, uh, um, you that last Crowder, play where Draymond got hit in the head was yeah, where he gets hit in the head. Draymond's dead, right? Draymond's yeah. on the floor. Please, Jesus, I just want one more bucket. <laughs> Please get me to this next bucket. <laughs> Seven I don't pound, know. baby. If you Jesus. give me a little bit more life. But then on the other end, Crowder's uh, uh, coming from out of bounds, walks right into Draymond. Draymond hits him with a, come on, bro, we're not doing that. Crowder's falling into the ref. <laughs> Trying not, to get himself. If you're not like, watching on YouTube, you're doing yourself a disservice. Right? Bro, like <laughs> that movie you just made. Falling into the ref. <laughs> like, we're looking at Jay Crowder. Like, fam, you could knock Jay Crowder over with your best Will Smith. And you telling no. me right now. <laughs> You're telling me right now that he hit you with a light elbow and you're falling into the ref about to die. The refs went to review to see if it was flagrant, took two seconds and said, shoot the free throws. What are we doing right now? Like that, come on, bro. You, I hate the flopathon at the end. Let's play ball. You're against either. You're against both players. You're, you're down for <sighs> neither of them. Yeah, I I, I hate the flop because it slows the game. I get the tactic of it. Oh, for but it's sure. Like, like I guess it worked for Draymond on one side and didn't work for Crowder on the other. So props on Draymond. But it just looks like it's like, dude, I would pick both of y'all to be on my side in a street fight. And yet in the middle of a basketball game, you're telling me right now <laughs> you're both falling on the floor, struggling, <laughs> holding on to the last strands of life that are left for you. Come on, dog. We got to do better than this. We're better than this. Do better. Do better, NBA. Uh <laughs> Speaking of doing better, the Dallas Mavericks, since the Golden State Warriors lost, the Dallas Mavericks move into the number three seed in the NBA. Let's go. go. It's been a long time coming. At one point, the Mavs were like 16 and 18. It was looking real bad. Now here they are all the way back. They beat the Cleveland Cavaliers in this game, 120 to 112. It was it was not a blowout as as much as you'd think, especially with the Cavs missing Jared Allen, Evan Mobley. Obviously, still Colin Sexton out, but at you know the Cavs had an eight point lead at one point. They were leading most of the second quarter, and then into the third quarter, the Mavs just took over in the second half. They only allowed the Cavs to score twenty two points in the third quarter and twenty three points in the fourth quarter, and they just outscored them at the end. Uh, Dorian Finney Smith hits a new career high twenty eight points. 
He had six threes. He's just so incredibly important. We talked about him a lot on Lockdown Maps today yeah. about how his development has been huge for this Mavericks team. Luka, obviously, had an incredible game. 35 points, 13 assists, one rebound shy of having an amazing game, but still yeah. still a pretty still a pretty good game for him. Um, great game for Luka. He had eight assists in the first quarter. He was just dishing and diming. But now this Mavericks team moves into – the number three seed, now that the Warriors lost, they uh, have the tiebreaker against the Warriors. That's why they move ahead, which still matches them against the Jazz if the playoffs were to happen right now. If you were the Mavericks, Pat, would you rather play the Nuggets, the Warriors, or the Jazz right now, the way they're all playing? There's there's no point where I wouldn't rather play the Jazz. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to lie to you. Listen, if you guys can send the Jazz to the Eastern Conference for the Bulls to match up against, I would absolutely, with the slide we've going on, I would absolutely take the Jazz in a seven-game series and be very okay with that. Like, the Jazz are a weird team to me. It's like, I see talented player there. I see talented player there. What's it going to amount to? A team that's going to get beat probably in the first round based on a team that's playing it, especially with you guys out in Dallas matching up with and bringing in Luka Doncic. There's no better way to say it than what J.B. Bickerstaff said. He's a wizard with the basketball in his hands. I, I, I watch Luka and so many times I'm just like, what, what did he just do? Hold on. We got to run that back real quick. Did you see the play against Moses Brown, his former teammate? What did he just do? Put it on his back, and Moses got completely turned around. It was like, oh, man. (laughs) Bro, I I spend nights just watching Luca, just like, how's no one? I I said it last time I was on Locked On NBA. I'll say it this time. (laughs) How is his name not in the MVP conversation? He's doing exactly there. What LeBron James has done, he's doing better than what LeBron James did at this point in his career. Now, granted, very different NBAs, I understand that point. But he's doing better than what LeBron James has done mostly this season. Statistically, yeah. Statistically, I mean, if we're being real about it, and no one even brings his name up. I get Embiid's a monster. I get that Jokic is a monster. I get that DeMar DeRozan should be top five. But guess what? DeMar DeRozan's in the conversation, and Luka's a better player. Better record than the Sixers, almost a better record than the Bucks. The Bucks have played two less games, so. I, my uh, mind's blown on the dog. Listen, I, I'm going to be real with you. I, I, I feel for y'all down in Dallas. For some reason, the NBA does not look at, at, at the Mavericks as a team that can host a, a MVP consistently. Meanwhile, this dude's well, been the, this- the last time it happened, it did not go well. Let's just, let's just say uh, that. Well, I, I won't mean, have to bring that back up for Mavs fans. Th- th- this dude's been doing this. Like, this isn't new, Luca. Now, granted, no. I'll say this is in shape, Luca. He came into the, into the season a little pudgy. You know what I'm saying? But this isn't new, Luca. No. He's been doing this. He's been doing this for what? How long has he been in the NBA? Four years now? Fourth Three year. Three years? Fourth year. This is this is what Luca does, and no one's looking at him. I think that it's a it, it it's a shame that he doesn't get more praise for what he does. And if you're not watching his games, you're doing yourself a disservice. And it, any team that matches up against him, minus I might say, uh, 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 Phoenix. Yeah. I, I'll say Phoenix, but I mean any team that matches up against him with now some help in Spencer Dinwiddie, what he's able to do now, he wasn't able to go tonight. Out of uh. uh uh, Second night of a back-to-back, he sits. It's the last back-to-back. Yeah, he, he wasn't able to go tonight. But when Luca has his deficiencies, now there's somebody to pick him up. Oh, wait, there's also Jalen Brunson. Oh, wait, there's a, like there's a ton of talent on this team. I wouldn't want to be anybody having to run up against this Mavs team in a seven-game series in the first round, at a minimum, if nothing else, because I know it's going to go six or seven. It did against those Clippers teams. And uh, they absolutely – now they're not going to play at that team, like, hopefully, unless Paul George is like, yeah, let's see what Paul that play in. But coming up, let's get into Miami versus Boston in the Eastern Conference. That game, another barn burner in the NBA, is Miami, proving that they are still the best team in the East. We'll talk about that and more coming up. But before we do, let me tell you about NBA Top Shot. It's the officially licensed NFT of the NBA. Connect a passionate community – of NBA fans across the globe, and build your collection. You can grab all kinds of different moments. I got moments of Jalen Green. I got moments of, uh, I got a moment of Bryn Forbes. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no. It's like, oh, no, a Bryn Forbes moment. But in the moment, it's a handles moment, and he crosses he crosses over, like this guy Ish Wright, Ishmael Wright, 
<laughs> and he falls over completely. He just completely floors him and then hits a floater. Now it's like, okay, it's a nice moment. It's a nice moment for a common one. You can get yours today. You can trade them. You can put them on the stock market. You can sell them. You can do all kinds of stuff. You can play fantasy games with them. If you sign up for Top Shot today, the best way to get started is get yourself a starter pack. You can pull a moment of a superstar like LeBron, KD, DeMar DeRozan, or get a rookie like Cade Cunningham, Evan Mobley for just $9. Head over to LockedOn.NBATopShot.com. Start building your collection today. That's LockedOn.NBATopShot.com. Build your collection today. Thanks for making Locked On NBA your first listen for your next listen. Check out the Locked On Now podcast, nightly recaps of every NBA game with analysis from local experts like us. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Pat, let's get back into these games. The Golden, they're the uh, the Boston Celtics lose ninety eight to one hundred and six to the Miami Heat, and this this game was back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. Felt like the Celtics really wanted to put their uh, their their imprint on the East and say, "Hey, we are the number one seed. We have gotten the number one seed." The Heat were like, "Hey, we've been the number one seed. We want to keep it." Yeah. And then the fourth quarter hit, and man, that Miami Heat defense just really ramped up. They only allowed the Celtics to score fifteen points. In the fourth quarter, Jason Tatum only took three shots in the fourth quarter. Jalen Brown went two of ten from the field in the fourth quarter. Smart got ejected late because of whistles, and they were arguing all kinds of stuff back and forth. The Celtics only scored six points in the last six minutes. What happened to the Celtics in this game? Uh, I think you're seeing them try to adjust with life without Robert Williams. Um, And I'm not going to lie to you. Not a bad life. If you watch this game all the way through, you you watch how that fourth quarter goes, right? They struggle to get the offense going. Miami's a really good defensive team. We're not shocked by that. I think we're more shocked by the fact that Miami went on this slide the way that they did, right? Yeah. So Miami going on this slide, we're like, oh, and now everybody should beat them. Now Boston should be able to beat them. Now Miami's still a really good defensive team. They still got Jimmy Butler down there? I think so. They're going to be able to get themselves up. For a defensive moment, Kyle Lowry coming through, absolutely getting the job done for him. And Bam, the, the biggest difference maker in this game to me, we can look at Jalen Brown's numbers, we can look at Jimmy Butler's numbers. Bam out of bio, 17 and 12. He also had, am I, am I, am I reading this correctly? Let me, <laughs> let me adjust this. Eight assists. From your center. That's what you want. From your center. And, and you see the immediate impact that not having that defensive anchor has on the Boston Celtics. Now, I know Boston fans went at me a little bit last week. I'm sorry that y'all are upset. It's okay. Don't apologize. No, I'm not not sorry, but I'm sorry that they're upset. You know what I'm saying? But but here's the thing, right? I'm sorry that you're upset. If you're a Boston fan today, right? That never worked for any of your girlfriends ever. It's okay. Yeah, she'll get it. (laughs) But if you're a Boston fan today, right, like, you almost, like, yes, you lost this game. It got away from you in the fourth. You actually did some a lot of good things in this game to keep this game competitive the entire way. Mm-hmm. And you found some pieces off your bench that you can trust. If I'm a Boston fan, I don't come out of this game looking at the fact that uh, 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 we lost to the Miami Heat. I come out of this game looking at the fact that Daniel Tice, by the way, the former Chicago Bull, Daniel Tice <laughs> showed that, hey, if you guys need me and you put me in Stop the roster gap. and you play me with consistent minutes, I can give you 15 on six of six while giving you pretty good defense. I think I think that Boston is trying to find its way as it gets closer to the playoffs here. And I'm not going to lie to you. I look at this game as a game where, yes, you did lose this game, but you have to adjust. Like, a lot of people think it's NBA 2K where, yeah, we lost this guy. Now let's put this guy in, and it's going to work perfectly. That's not how the NBA works. Al Horford came out, absolutely gave you great minutes, and you got that from Daniel Tice off of the bench. I think that Boston should feel good heading into the playoffs that you've got these two guys on the team right now. I don't know what that means for a championship run, but I feel like looking at tonight's game, man, and looking at what Miami can do, you you feel better than what you thought you were going to feel losing a big anchor in the middle. On the Miami side, this is what you're supposed to do. You're the number one seed in the Eastern Conference. I'm going to be honest with you, and I'm going to ask you, dog, is this the first time it feels like Miami is legitimately playing on the same page since they've hit this skid? And the reason I ask is because on our channel over on, on, over on the Windy City Breeze, we legitimately – legitimately we're like are they tanking right now are they trying to avoid brooklyn right now 
it seemed like that for a minute. And so they had they had that bounce back win where yeah. Spo was like, we're playing against this Kings team and they play fast. So they play hard. We're going to play. And I was like, okay, well, what? now this is a win against a good team, right? This yeah. is a win against the hottest team in the NBA. They come in here and I thought the big change for them. So they put Max Struess in the, in the starting lineup. Yes. They put him in there. He made some great plays late. He took that charge on Tatum late. He was four of nine from three. That was a big deal for them. But it was Kyle Lowry taking over the offense. It was Kyle Lowry. Uh, I, I can't find I was looking for it. So I can't find it. But somebody had tweeted out like all the cr- crunch time offense for the, for the Miami Heat. And it was like Kyle Lowry pick and roll. Kyle Lowry pick and roll. Kyle Lowry iso. Kyle Lowry this. Kyle Lowry swing back. It was like Kyle Lowry was in the middle of all of it. And he's the guy that has the championship experience on this team. That's you know outside of outside of a bubble, <laughs> and and Kyle Lowry is the one that I think is going to to help them get to that next step. He's the one that has to run their offense because they've been trying to find out. Okay, late in games, if we can't rely on Tyler Hero and he played all twelve minutes in the fourth and only took two shots and missed them both, like if, if he's had games like that, if we can't just rely on Hero for offense, where does it? Where else does it come from? It wasn't yeah. coming from Butler. It wasn't coming from Bam. Maybe it's Kyle Lowry just facilitating and setting up up, up enough stuff to get it going. And I think that was the the big change for Miami. Lots more on Lockdown Celtics and Lockdown Heat. Um, Coming up, let's get into the Minnesota Timberwolves versus Toronto Raptors. The Raptors, man. That Raptors team is playing really well. And then we'll play our favorite game every week where we count up the most fun, interesting questions in the NBA. We'll talk about all that and more coming up. Before we do, let me tell you about betonline.net. It's your number one source for all your betting and sports info from the latest odds, contests, and player props. You name it. Go check out BetOnline right now. The tournament. This weekend, there's a whole bunch of props and fun stuff for the tournament. They have props all over March Madness. Uh, Pat, over under 21 and a half points for the highest scoring player in the Final Four. Will anybody in the Final Four score over 21 and a half points? I'm going to go under, but because it becomes such a team game it's, at it's, this point, it slows down so yeah. much in the in the final four. So yeah. I think I would go under with you as well. But if you're feeling good about Paolo, if you're feeling good about any of those guys on UNC, I feel like they, they can go off. Yeah. Go ahead and head to Bet Online, head to the website today. Use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and actions. Not just college basketball; they have NBA, they have all, all kinds of props and odds for the NFL, and all kinds of things all throughout the offseason. Bet Online, it's where the game starts. All right, Pat, let's get back into the action in the NBA. The Minnesota Timberwolves have kind of gone on a little bit of a. a, a a slide here recently. They've fallen back into the seventh seed. They lose to the Toronto Raptors, 125 to 102. Uh, the Timberwolves had the lead for pretty much the entire first half. And then the Raptors just took over in the third quarter. And then the fourth quarter, they expanded their lead to 27 points. And it just became a blowout after that. Um, Malik Beasley was out for the Timberwolves. But it was the, that second to third quarter where basically the, <laughs> the Timberwolves had their biggest lead of 17 points in the second quarter. And then at the end of the third quarter, the the Raptors have a 10-point lead at that. So it's a huge swing right there. In that stretch, so the second and third quarters together, Anthony Edwards for the Timberwolves was a minus 28 in the 19 minutes he played. Yeah. That was how bad the Timberwolves played during that stretch. They had eight turnovers. They shot 19 of 49 from the field, just 38%. They just couldn't find what their, where their offense was coming from. And on the Raptors' side, Gary Trent Jr., OG Ananobi, 18 points, 17 points for them, respectively, in that stretch. Precious Achua had 13 points in that stretch. In that stretch, again, I'm still talking about that second to third quarter stretch for this game. Pascal Siakam, 8 points, 8 rebounds, 10 assists for Siakam just in that second to third quarter. He ends the game with 13 assists, a triple-double for him. Uh, this team is playing This team is playing really well right now. They won 10 out of their last 12 games with wins against Phoenix, Boston, Philly, Denver, and Minnesota now. Pressure, and this team is just playing so well. I don't think anybody wants to see this team right now. They play this wild lineup of like all these dudes that are just six six to six <laughs> nine, and they just switch everything. And you're just trying to figure out, okay, who can I go up against? And you're like, this team is small, but they're also really big, and they're just confusing. And I love this team. I love this. I love OG and Anobi. He's back. He's been an incredible, um, you know, bring back for them. And all of a sudden, this Raptors team is comfortably in six they're two games ahead of the Cavs right now yeah and they're gonna face off against the Sixers and I, I that's game that season that series may go seven if Harden isn't isn't cooking the way that he normally is 
I think that series could end quicker than we think with Toronto in the favor. Let's not forget Toronto's one of the, listen, listen, listen. Toronto's got a soft spot for me in my heart because of Fred Van Vliet, Illinois native. Yeah, you know I'm saying <laughs> we was all in high school at the same time. He's doing much better than I am right now. But you know what I'm saying? Nah, come yeah, on. I'm saying shout out my boy Aaron Simpson. He was beating him in scoring. We was in high school. But anyway, the Raptors are legitimately one of the best coach teams in the NBA. Yeah. And the talent on that team is not sub part talent this is talent that has playoff experience minus your one playing scotty barnes who i think that they'll lean on like they have leaned on him but if guys like og ananobi and pascal siakam and oh by the way gary trent jr who was absolutely filleting off, tonight yeah. for 29 points on nine of 13 shooting six for eight from the three-point line if those guys can step up and continue to help the young fella while, while giving the experience and he's just kind of giving the, hey, I don't know, I'm supposed to be here yet. I'm just going to keep doing what I do with his 17, 5, and 4, and 7 of 9 shooting. I think this team can actually be a team you have to fear in the East. And and I, I'm not going to lie to you. Tonight's game speaks more to Minnesota, right? Last time we were on yes. here, I think you said Minnesota was top 11 in defense in the second half of the year. Yeah, they not had tonight. been. So, to, to the point where Pascal Siakam said, as he was dishing out his career high in assists <laughs> with 13 assists, he literally says in the postgame show, man, every time down the floor, everyone was just open. <laughs> what? What? What did you just say? Yeah, every time down the floor, everybody was just open. What I, an I, unintentional I, great burn from Pascal Siakam on a defense. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, and it, it's it's... It's what you saw tonight. It's indicative of the game tonight, and I'm not going to lie to you. Like, this Timberwolves team has a ridiculous amount of talent, but I'm going to tell you as a Bulls fan, talent on the offensive end <laughs> and not on the right. defensive end leads to a team that is going to start sliding. You have to make these plays on the defensive end. We haven't seen a defensive anchor really pop up outside of Pat Beverly, who, yeah, he's a defensive anchor. He's a nice piece. But are we really going to say, like, he's the clamp that Minnesota needs to lock this stuff down? On the flip side, hey, with a I team like Toronto, I'll you tell see you how they'll take advantage. I'll tell you what Luca would say about him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like too small, too small to be the defensive clamp. And Carl Anthony Towns got in foul trouble in this game, and it's just there's a lot that has to go right for this Timberwolves team, right? And yeah. it has been going right for the last couple of months. They've been an incredible. They've been an incredible team, but they're still young. And so when the chips, you know, when the chips fall, you got to rely on a couple of things, a couple of go to things, a couple of go to defenders. And Towns got to defend. Edwards got to defend. Russell's got to defend. Man, <laughs> it, it, there's me, a lot. There's a lot to rely on. A lot has to go right for them. Let me ask you this: Has D'Angelo Russell died out there? I feel like D'Lo <laughs> is a, a a guy now. He he's been able to hide, right? He's been able to hide a little bit and have a couple of games here and there where he pops off. He can hit a bunch of threes. But Edwards and Towns have been the ones that have like I feel like are are pushing him forward. And and D'Lo's been able to be like, I'll be the third guy. Like you know, yeah, I'll be okay. So yeah, he went three of fifteen in this game. It's those games where they they need him to go to go off. They need one of those three guys to go off, and they just don't seem to get him for some reason. Every time right. I check in on them, and it's like a must win game for them, like a big game for them. It just seems like one of those guys, or or two or three, two of three of those guys just don't get it. And tonight it was yeah. Towns and Russell. Yeah, especially on the defensive end. Though. That that's the that's the hardest part. And you're not going to win many games when D'Lo only shoots three for fifteen, one for seven from the three point line. But yeah, not even not that. Like I'm cool with that if you give me the assist numbers he's giving you a good chunk of the season, ten or, or seven to ten assists a game. He gave you three tonight. Hey, dog, you got to facilitate, my boy. What's going on? Have to. <laughs> have to. Speaking of facilitating, let's go through the rest of the games in the NBA. It's our favorite segment every single week. Count it up. Count it up. Count it up. Count it. Count it up. The Denver Nuggets get out to a 50 to 19 point lead against the Indiana Pacers. And yet... The Pacers came back and got a lead at the end of the third quarter. They legitimately had a 31-point lead, and the Pacers came back all the way back and got a lead uh, in this game. Jokic still had his, his incredible numbers like he always does, 37 points, 13 boards, 9 assists, but he had 7 turnovers, 19 turnovers for the Nuggets as a whole. But, Pat, Count it up. how big of a lead do you have to have in the NBA to feel safe? Because I've seen teams come back from 30. I've seen teams come back from, obviously, 20. And it just seems like nowadays in the NBA, elite, you're just never safe. If you're not at 35 
<laughs> in the third. Yeah. <laughs> don't feel safe. These teams offensively are different. And the reason is because, like we just talked about with the Minnesota Timberwolves, remember last week, they got sunburned after leading the whole game. Mm -hmm. Like, you're not playing good enough defense on the other side of the ball. Like, good defense now is keeping teams to 105 points a game. So, like, you're not playing good enough defense on the other side of the court for you to just let people come down and shoot the ball willy-nilly on that side of the court, dog. So for me, that that is a – I'm not even surprised by that. When when you saw the Pacers come back, it's like, yeah, that's the modern NBA. Welcome to 2022. The <laughs> most surprising thing of the night was Austin Rivers getting ejected on what oh, I can 110% <laughs> call – the weakest flagrant <laughs> foul, technical foul I've ever seen in my life to the point where the Pacers announcer literally goes, yeah, he got him in the face right here. Look at it. Yeah, he, he goes, I'm not going to lie to look, you, dog. That's look BS at this. Right right, there. He's like, look at this right here. Here's the foul. Nah, I can't. I can't. He's like, nah, hey, bro. That's not it. Bro, bro, I've never seen that. I've seen that one time when Stacy, when Denzel Valentine put up that three and Stacey King goes, oh, no, you usually die with your team. Like, <laughs> Like, it's usually like, I'm rolling with you. No matter what, I got yeah. – it was so egregious that he was like, oh, I'm not going to lie to you. That I What is that, dog? Like, what are we talking about right now? So, I I, I would say if you're going to talk about a lead, I, I mean, dude, they, they shoot too well now. It, it's they ridiculous. They do. And it's not – they're not even good players playing on the bases right now. They're not trying to win. It's like Buddy Heal, Justin Anderson, obviously Tyrese Halliburton, Gogo yeah. Batazzi. Yeah. Oof, man. Brutal. Uh, speaking of brutal, Kelvin Johnson smoked a game-winning layup against short-arm Desmond Bain to lose 111 to 112 against the Memphis Grizzlies. You don't remember the draft stuff about Desmond Bain having, short, I do. I having do. short arms? So, if you're Kelvin Johnson, Pat, Count it up. how many days till you get over smoking that layup? Because for me, it, it may take me. I, I may think about that and for days and then the next time we play the, the grizzlies i would just i would not be able to forget that just missing that layup thinking about that moment over and over again at home you have the you know the home crowd is just waiting for a win like trying to stay in this play-in race the bench is right across from him as he tries to get that layup yeah. that was a brutal one um I mean, that's probably why me and you aren't in the NBA. Uh, it would take me <laughs> oh, for sure. It, it would take me a couple of days, minus you know the 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 non forty inch vertical, uh, <laughs> and that growth spurt my dad promised me. Oh, uh, it never came. Yeah, it never came. I, I got the six foot. Like, You'll be six six one day, son. Okay, <laughs> I didn't make it. It's okay. But no, I, I to me like you're you're legitimately like if you're good at your job, if you're a a professional. Take tonight, soak on it. And, and, and I always think about how Kobe said it. You want to watch those moments. You want to mm. watch what caused you to miss that layup. You want to watch what caused you to not be prepared for that moment so that in the next moment when that moment comes, you are prepared for that moment. So I would hope that that's what Keldon Johnson is doing tonight because this is big for San Antonio. This is yeah, not, you know what it. I'm saying? Like, it's it's one of those games where we look at it and we're like, oh, God. But, I mean, I, I, maybe maybe <laughs> – Maybe it's not as big for Pop. Pop's got to be like, bro, please, please put the bullet in there and end this season. But I mean, let me go for, back to my winery. I, my I, vineyard. I'm so done with this. Like, please. Spurs, just Spurs fell out of the play in because of this one, and Lakers are back in. I'm sure everyone will be talking about the Lakers. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, that, this is a big one for the Spurs. Speaking of a team at the end of the play in, the Atlanta Hawks get a win 136 to 118 against some players wearing OKC Thunder jerseys. Like, I, can we even call this team the OKC Thunder? Here's some players that play. Poku, we know. And Aaron Wiggins, not even Andrew Wiggins. He's been playing all year. Isaiah Roby, uh, Teo Maladon, the guy that led them in scoring. Cindy Waters, the third. Is that a real player? Did I make it up? You made that up. Isn't it L Lindsay Water or Lindy Waters? Something like <laughs> Lindy that? Waters, yeah, was, Lindy Waters, yeah. Lindy Waters, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Trying to see if I can catch on. <laughs> catch it's on a weird, one. it's a weird one, dog. Hey, I, <laughs> hey, it's still like I know his name. Who? I, play, play who he played for, and put them all on OKC, and and Chuck would not not pass that game at all. But 
Trey Young gets 40 points. Kevin Herter and Bogdanovich both put in 20. DeAndre Hunter had 19. Everybody was scoring for this team. But Count it up. is this the game that finally kickstarted it for the Hawks? And do you believe in them at all to get out of the play in now? Not now, not now after this game, but at this point in the season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you got the Cavs next. Cavs is a beatable team for Atlanta. You've got the Nets. That's a that's a good test for them. I, I'm not gonna lie to you, right? It, it's a great test for them, seeing as how they might have to play them if the Nets somehow manage to not win the the first game. Yep. Um, but it, the Nets have been in competitive game. Their last game out, they played a massively competitive game versus the Detroit Pistons. Who, yes, they have been playing a little bit better. Pistons but let's not cap Chicago all day. Detroit. Are we talking about Detroit right now? What are we talking about? <laughs> Little Caesars in the stadium? Like, okay. So I feel like Eight you miles. might. I, I don't know if you got a shot. Like, it's in Atlanta, maybe. But you got a chance to show them. Then you got the Raptors, Wizards. I think those are two games where you can at least be competitive in. I don't know what the uh, the COVID standing for all of the Hawks are. So I don't know if everybody can play out in Toronto. And then you're going to Miami and you finish out with the Rockets. I mean, you it's going to be – I think the the Atlanta situation is more based on what everyone else above them does. Like if, team, if Charlotte kind of hits a skid, if Brooklyn hits a skid, if if uh, 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 C- Cleveland continues to slide the way they do. But they got a lot of ground to cover to get out of this play-in game. All right, moving on to another team fighting for their play, play in life right now. The New Orleans Pelicans get a win 117-107 to 107 against the Portland Trailblazers. CJ McCollum leads them in scoring 25 points, four assists. Jonas Valanciunas had a really good fourth quarter to get them this win uh, against the Blazers team that is also a, a collection of basketball players wearing Portland Trailblazers jerseys. Not sure that we get like that them versus OKC would just be like a who he play for like Super Bowl. <laughs> uh, but let's focus on CJ McCollum. Count, yeah. count it up. Is he he's been the leader that this this team needed for a long time, right? Yeah, I mean, you you look at somebody, listen, I've always looked at CJ as a guy who like, hey, look, that's CJ. Hey, that's Dame. It's like the Spider-Man meme. They're pointing at each other (laughs) on the sides. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like CJ's just hasn't gotten that same shine that Mm. that those other guys have gotten. But since being traded down to the Blazers, let me give you his numbers real quick. Just just small improvement in his game. Uh, 26.1 points a game, uh, 4.9 rebounds a game, 6.6 assists, 51% from the three-point line. Yeah, he's the guy that understands how to be in those big playoff situations. And you mentioned it, dog. I'm not going to lie to you. The New Orleans team doesn't have a void of talent right now. You're running out there with Larry Nance Jr., who is a really nice player, really good off of the bench. Brandon Ingram, Jonas Valanciunas, who I don't know if y'all noticed, but like Jonas Valanciunas somehow has turned himself into a double-double machine, and he's averaging over 18 points in the last 10 games. So he he's all of a sudden become a monster down there. Oh, by the way, he also is a, a three-point threat. Uh, did knock one <laughs> down tonight, but somebody that can extend the floor for you. So a very interesting team. To me, you had Zion Williamson back into this. I, I, I don't know. He's not coming this year, but I, not this year. I, I don't know what that's gonna be. But he put Zion in, in the Jackson Hayes role that he's been playing right now. Jackson Hayes has been playing the four for them. Yeah, he put Zion in that role. Like I, this I don't know. Team scary dog. Like are we it, are we talking about this team the same way we are about about Minnesota? Probably. I feel like better because I feel like you would have a a, a better defensive core. And like CJ's there. a better version of what everything we were just saying about D'Lo, right? Yes. So so to me, this team right here, like CJ McCullum, whether he stays or not, that's going to be interesting to see. But CJ McCullum to me is the most interesting piece that's been added to this team because Brandon Ingram can have those nights like he had tonight. Yep. Where he shoots four for 12. You're like, what the heck happened to Brandon Ingram? But – with CJ on the team, with Jonas on the team, you add Zion back in it. This team could be scary for a long time, bro. And then they'll probably just trade Zion. He'll probably request a trade yeah. in the offseason. And, well, you know, and then here we go. Yeah, you know, what do you do? You know, what do you, what do you <laughs> speaking of what do you do? The Orlando Magic lose 110 to 127 to the Washington Wizards. Washington, all of a sudden, Christoph Porzingis, 35 points for him, eight boards, three assists, couple of blocks. Count it up. Is this Wizards team a playoff team next year? They get Beal back. They get Kyle Kuzma back. They have some of these guys that can maybe take a step forward. Rui Hachimura has been, you know, has been you know pretty good, but he yeah. had a weird start to a season that just didn't get off to the right foot. Maybe he comes back. Yep. 
my my lockdown Mavs listeners will appreciate this. Maybe Christoph Porzingis another healthy off season. <laughs> take a drink and take a drink every time you've heard that. Uh, do you believe in this Wizards team as a potential playoff team? I think any team with Bradley Beal healthy is a potential playoff team. Um, but you absolutely have to have those surrounding pieces with it. I think that the underrated matchup uh, there is what we've seen from KP and Kyle Kuzma when they're both on the floor together. We haven't seen a lot of teams that come out with that Twin Towers effect that's actually good. I think Kyle Kuzma finally figured out, hey, maybe because I'm 6'10", I should go down in the post and make a turnaround (laughs) floater, and I'm pretty good at that. You know what I'm saying? I think we've seen him kind of flourish out there with his own opportunity out in Washington. So I think this team could be a playoff team next season. I think this team could be a threat. I think I don't know if they jump straight into, you know, like the Bulls did jump straight up to to five, you know what I'm saying, straight from the bottom but i think that this is a team that is dangerous and maybe you just get a get a point guard in there maybe to make bradley beal's life a little bit easier oh you just traded him to the mavs didn't you i forgot about that but <laughs> hey you know what a big point guard yeah it, you know what i'm saying it, it, it is what it is so i th- i think this team's gonna be interesting i w- what do you think on it? yeah i, I... <sighs> We'll see. We'll see. They, have to, they, have to, they have to make a lot of different changes, but I could see like Denny and Rui taking a step forward, like a big step forward. Yeah. And then all of us and, and Gafford, like taking a big step forward. He had 17 and seven and three blocks in this game. Like if those guys take a big step forward, they figure out, okay, put Gafford next to KP. That's a, like if KP was playing the defense that he was playing with the Mavs this year and Gafford plays that, then all of a sudden you just can't go to the rim on that team. Like that would yeah. just be so hard to play a, to play a two towers lineup like that. So uh, they have some things to figure out, but it could happen for them for sure, especially with Bradley Beal. Uh, all right, two more games. Let's rapid fire these ones. The Charlotte Hornets get a win, 125 to 114. Good for them. They've been playing really well recently. They're they're threatening the Nets all of a sudden, but I don't care about them right now. You know who I care about? Julius Randle in Madison Square Garden gets booed in the starting lineup because there's a WFAN the radio station in New York that had a report that he requested a trade and wanted out from the Knicks. And so the Knicks fans latch onto that. They boo him <laughs> relentlessly in the starting lineup. And the agent comes out and says, that's not true. A bunch of other reports say that's not true, but let's just, let's just play the hypothetical game. Cause that's, that's what count it up's all about. Count it up. Who'd be better off Randall for getting away from the Knicks or the Knicks for getting away from Randall. I ain't gonna lie to you dog. <laughs> any, any Randall. Julius, look at me. Come here, brother. Come here. We talking personal right here. Get out. Get out, bro. Because I'm not going to lie to you. Are you doing the T thing? In, any any, any fan base that would believe that a player went to ownership and said, hey, trade me after the trade deadline. <laughs> how With dumb games, are y'all? Games left to be played. How, how, how naive do you have to be to believe this, bro? Like, like. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm flabbergasted about Julius. Get out, bro. Listen, Julius Randall. There's two things we know about Julius Randall. Nice guy. Always going left. That's okay. Yep. Get to any team in the NBA and they will put something around you that will help you to succeed. You know what the Knicks don't do? Succeed. Get out of there. They still talk about New York as the Mecca of basketball. Stop it. Like, what are we talking <laughs> about right now? Madison Square Garden's the greatest place to play. Why is KD over in the Barclays Center? Stop playing with me, dog. Get away from the Knicks. Any, anybody, everybody, Fibs, the whole, whole, whole front. Derek, get away. Who's left? Taj. RJ. Taj, you got crossed up on the Knicks. Get out of there, bro. Come on, bro. Last game, the Houston Rockets lose 118 to 121. That's what they want. No Sabonis, no Fox for the Kings still. But the Rockets lose. That's what they want. They get 32 points from Jalen Green, 30, 12, and 12 from Kevin Porter Jr. I think that's his first triple-double in his career. But Jalen Green's the one I want to focus on. Ties his career high of 32 points. These are his stats in March. 20 points per game, almost 21 points a game. 48% from the field, 40% from three. So... Count it up. How long until Jalen Green leads the NBA in scoring? This is his rookie year. He's averaging 20 points in the month of March. A couple 30-point games. The guy's got a bag. I'm, I think in five years, I think he leads the, the, the NBA you in scoring. You know what? I, I don't know if he ever will. And it's not a slight to Jalen Green. It's not a slight to how he's playing. It's not a slight to how he's hooping. 
there's so much young talent in this NBA right true, now. True. Like there's so much. I, if you're an NBA fan right now and you're not excited by what you're seeing right now, you're not an NBA fan right now. Like if you don't love this, you don't love NBA basketball, dog. I, I'm I'm legit. Like the NBA is thanking its stars right now. As it it was like, hey, uh, KD, how old are you? Oh, okay, James, how old are? Oh, okay, uh, Russ. Uh, oh boy, Brian, how old are? We're running out of people, dog. Like, who's next? The NBA is thanking the stars that it has guys like Ja Morant, Jalen Green. I'm going to throw Shea Gilgis in there because I really like sure, him. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, the, there's the next up-and-coming generation here, and it's not a slight to Jalen Green at all. But I feel like, one, Jalen Green has the opportunity to do this based on the fact no Sengun, no Christian Wood, no Ergo. There's no one left. <laughs> like they're, <laughs> they're just like, hey, uh, anybody want to play basketball in the stands this year? Minus John Wall. You can't come back. I was back. Gonna say, they got, they got $40 else? million dollars of John Wall on the bench, too. Yeah. So, Somewhere. So not even on the bench. I, I think he's getting these points not to slight him, but because of what uh, – uh, uh, isn't there and, and i think what you're excited to see is that him and kevin porter seem to have a really good working relationship together you get to add christian wood and all that back in hopefully they take some steps there you go that's the sec that's the nba tonight thanks for making locked on nba your first listen every day now make your second listen locked on mavs or locked on bulls go listen to those experts covering the biggest stories around the nba everything in 30 minutes guys thanks so much for listening to locked on nba boom